Uh, heads up, there's some homophobia and derogatory comments about sex workers in the movie today, but they're all so ridiculous, I don't know that it matters. Pick up, pick up, pick up. Pick You've up. reached the voicemail box of Badass, Damn. Matt. I'm filming a Shrek movie right now, so please leave a message. Hey, Badass Matt, it's me, Matt. Listen, I found this movie called Erotic Diary of a Lumberjack. It's like a lumberjack porno. There'll be none of that, Mr. Presents. Hey man, I'm gonna have to let you go. An old lady has broken into my apartment. I think she's supposed to be British, but there's a distinct southern drawl to her accent. So, not really sure what she's going for with that voice. Anyway, call me back about the lumberjack porn. Uh, see ya. Your content simply will not stand, Mr. Presents. Okay, first off, my last name is not Presents. I am not Mr. Anything. Second off, who the fuck are you and what the fuck do you want? Oh, such language. I'm Martha Penthouse of the YouTube Viewers and Listeners Association, and I'm here on behalf of the organization to condemn your disgusting promotion of pornography. Yeah, but like... Porn is pretty cool, man. Ugh! We with the association would like to request you take a look at an informative piece of filmmaking titled The Lusting Hours, an anti-porn documentary from the good days of American culture. You mean when it was illegal for me to have a boyfriend? Yes. Well, at least you're honest. Let's take a look. Lady... This is a something weird triple feature that includes two pornos on it. Yes, unfortunately, that was the only copy we could find, but uh, do just watch The Lusting Hours. The Ultimate Degenerate? Oh shit, it's my biography! There were some movies, terrible movies, movies so awful, no one would touch. Then came a Matt, sad little Matt. Matt then decided these movies to watch. Today's episode, The Lusting Hours. <sighs> Hello, Internet. I am a degenerate, and I gotta say, this format is not really cut out for documentaries. Something silly like gun self-defense for women you can kind of get away with, but usually the problems with a documentary are going to be in the broad strokes or in very minor factual errors. Neither of which are particularly funny, at least not the way I've structured my show. But every now and then, you get the lusting hours. Released in 1967, The Lusting Hours was one of those it's not exploitation if we're telling you not to do something. And I think we should immediately be suspicious of the creator's intentions, considering before this they made films titled The Flesh of a Woman and The Diary of a Swinger. And this Something Weird release isn't helping. And the film notably stars exploitation power couple Michael and Roberta Findlay, the minds behind the Argentinian part of Snuff. Yeah, everything except the ending was these guys. Outside of them, though, most of these actors' careers begin and end here, with a few more only appearing in the director's next film, Curse of Her Flesh. Although I would be remiss not to mention that the narration was provided by a man credited as Gun Gun Sharper. But I don't want to tip my hand too far just yet, so let's set a little time aside for lust. This is The Lusting Hours. Oh, and if you need help, this movie kindly provides a definition of the word lust, as if I'm not experiencing it 24-7. And it starts with that most lustful act, holding hands. D does this guy know how hand-holding works? He kind of just 
grabs this woman's hand with his whole fist. The narrator warns us of the dangers of unnatural desire right before showing us a naked woman. Minute and 20 seconds. That's gotta be a record for this show. I'm, I'm not wearing a watch. I, I just checked the time code. But look at these lustful images. Naked women in seductive poses. The hypnotic swaying of hips. Paul McCartney underwater. You fools thought he died in a car wreck. But the lusting hours got the real facts. He was drowned. Yeah, there's multiple images of Paul and none of the other Beatles. I always kind of thought George was the cute one, but okay. This does feel like mom's finger wagging comparing the Beatles to porn. But then again, the rest of this movie. So the movie opens in a brothel out in a rural town, which the narrator makes seem kinda nice. Most girls know a good deal when they see it, and many stay for several years. And why not? The conditions are almost desirable. A private room, good meal, booze at a reduced rate, and seldom does a girl have to take on more than two customers a night. I don't know about that one, man. I mean, I'm sure there are good places, but there's also definitely a lot of seedy joints. Uh, frankly, I'd kind of like to hear this from the people who actually work there. And while the narrator's yammering on, these two women get in the most unenthusiastic fight ever. <sighs> no... Ah, but it was cleverly staged by the house, madam. Yeah, if I saw this at a brothel, I'd leave. If you can't fake enthusiasm for a fight, you can't fake enthusiasm for a fuck. You have broken my suspension of disbelief. Not that I really spend time in brothels. I, I mostly stay home and watch this shit. But hey, this guy's so impressed, he takes off his sunglasses and puts on his real glasses. Ah, oh, but here's the real shit. Satanic Rituals. Kinky. This is just a stimulant for their own self-gratification as they sit there in the dark, mentally arousing themselves and conjuring up super-sexual delights that will bring each individual to his own self-induced climax. Ew, don't self-induce climax in the theater. Get a room. Also, dear YouTube algorithm, she is wearing pasties. Do not give me shit for this. Unlike the girls who work for her, who are basically lazy, the madam has above average intelligence and likes hard work. Oh, wow. Tell us how you really feel, dude. I'd like to go ahead and apologize to any sex workers in the audience tonight. Thank you for your service to this country. Hey, ever wanted to see a strip show out of focus? Although I suppose this raises the question of how blurred out something needs to be before it's considered censored. And the satisfaction of a job well done. And why shouldn't she? For in her warped mind with its distorted values, she has achieved some kind of success. Oh man, I thought you liked the house, madam, but now you're talking about her warped mind and distorted values? You're the one showing us this shit, man. You didn't have to go here. Oh, but this is wild. The house, madam, also provides porn for some of the men. And thank porn for the internet. Could you imagine having to go to a brothel to buy that stuff? Like, at that point I might as well just hook up with one of the girls. And this phone call is so weird. You can see the madam, but never her mouth moving, and even when she's on screen she still has the phone filter on her voice. Ah, oh, come on, Stanley, it's all the same. Give me some wild stuff, you know. And then we sit in dead silence as this guy finds some porn. So now the focus shifts to the pornographer, the man who photographs naked women. What drives them on? What brings them back day after day to photograph the same girl? Uh, the money? And also maybe some of the sex appeal. I don't know, man. This seems like an obviously good job. I don't think you have to question it. Many times an overly protective family or one that suppresses any talk of sex or even a dominating mother can work what was once a normal attitude to work the opposite sex. <coughs> no comment. 
taking pictures of women is the first step towards total dependence on artificial sex stimulants. Actually, I think you're wrong about this one, man. I think if I actually had to film the porn myself, I'd lose interest in it pretty quickly. Credit where it's due, it at least sounds like they interviewed a real model. Their arrested stuff pays better, and I can sit down more, but the crowd is rougher. I mean, they're always on the make. You know the bit. I can't in any way verify they did, but at least they put up the facade this time. And she's got some good anecdotes. But they're very fussy about who they take, and they always want different girls. That's why I have so many wigs. I mean, sometimes I go back to the same guy with a different wig on, and he hires me all over again. Oh, and they gotta make the photographer sound as creepy as possible. Just the two of them alone. The photographer tells her how to pose, and watching, always watching her every move. No advances are made, no liberties are taken. But there is a tension, an uneasy calm as he goes about his business. Yeah, wild that he wouldn't just sexually harass her. Thanks for that, 1960s. But does she wonder why he wants to take endless pictures of her body and yet will never touch her or suggest any kind of physical act they might enjoy together? God, this is like the 60s version of calling someone a simp. So remember, if you watch porn, you'll only be interested in looking at women and can never be in a normal relationship with them. Anyway, here's a topless chick. And speaking of topless chicks, now it's their time to be verbally abused for the things the filmmakers are putting in the film. Can they still get enjoyment from a man they might sincerely be attracted to? Or do they become jaded and bored with normal relations? For many girls, the answer is no. Uh, that wasn't a yes or no question. No, they can't have meaningful relationships, or no, they don't get jaded and bored. Because I kind of think the answer is going to vary person to person. It's heavily implied one of these girls puts on a strap-on, but they're too pussy to actually show it on screen. And by they, I mean everyone alive in 1967. Woof, Marvel movies were way different back in the day. D does this woman know what a whip does? Has she ever held a whip before today? We get an extended strip sequence that ends with the narrator telling us the man watching it is way more fucked up for having seen it. This man is experiencing a strange sensation. He now realizes by watching this girl dance that by his own hand, he has dulled his sense of visual stimulation and must go further. He must transcend the ordinary and venture into the black abyss of the unknown. Well, great! Thanks for showing me that shit! She knows what he wants, and for a price, she will perform her particular service. Uh, yeah, man. That's how jobs work. Street walkers, hookers, hustlers, tarts, or prostitutes. Whatever they are called, they all have something in common. They are women. Well, that's just blatantly not true. Male prostitutes have been around just as long as women. Hell, in like 10 minutes, they start talking about male prostitutes. What do you mean, they're all women? They feature another interview here, and it's so frank, I think it must be authentic. They even have to cut her saying fuck. You know, that burns my ass, the way a lot of people knock us. I mean, look, these drips are supposed to be respectable, goody-goody community leaders and businessmen. Hell, if they're so f damn respectable, why is it that they have to come to me to get their rocks off? So yeah, they're kind of contradicting themselves. Not that I think the filmmakers actually believe any of the shit the narrator says. I think this is just a cheeky way of getting one over on the moral panic crowd. But now, my friends, it's time to talk about men. She knows he is only there for one reason, her money. Her checkbook brought them together, and if the check should stop, he would have no choice but to move on to greener pastures. Once again, that's just kind of how jobs work. If I'm not getting paid, I'm gonna go somewhere else. Ah, uh, but forget all that. Here's the saucy stuff. Yeah, that gay shit. This is old for a movie in the 60s when being gay was still kind of illegal. Not as illegal as it once was, but this is definitely outside the bounds of the law. Which of course leads to this galaxy-brained take. But psychologists claim that this anticipation, this element of danger, most appeals to these men. 
If the conditions were ideal, with no possibility of exposure or arrest, then the men would probably lose interest and find some other vicarious excitement. <laughs> men wouldn't be gay if it weren't illegal. It's like legalizing homosexuality is step one in eliminating the gays. This movie just got so bigoted it flipped back to being progressive. And then the male prostitute comes home to his dominatrix femboy wife. Get on your knees! I think I've seen this character in a Contra Points video. She's a little better with it, but I don't think anyone in this movie knows how whips work. Is she? He? Eh, it was the 60s. No one gave a shit. But apparently Dominatrix Femboy is the look they wanted for this movie because they are front and center on the posters. Although I suppose that would get me into a theater. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home and the loving mate. Hell yeah, I'll drink to that. In New York, where rents are extremely high, a large apartment in a posh Manhattan residential district runs more than $350 a month. $350 a month? Man. I should move to Manhattan. That's like half what I pay here. Gotta be honest, the call girl portion of the film is the least interesting. Probably because it's the least wild and depraved. And because it spends an ungodly amount of time on this lady dancing around, which, based on what we've heard so far, is probably corrupting my mind or some shit. And this woman goes ahead and shows off her nipples before putting on the pasties, which just seems like a waste. We've already seen them, just keep them out. We do not understand that a call girl does not make love, but rather manufactures it to order, dispensing it for a price and geared to a certain time schedule. Oh man, this narrator found the most 1960s way to say, I don't make love, I fuck. And to end things off, the narrator gives us a profound monologue. The time is now, not yesterday or tomorrow, but right now, while the body is young and the brain can still be dulled with alcohol. Live fast, die young, and make a beautiful corpse could well be the call girl's motto. Keep the music blaring and the action fast. Roll the dice, go for broke. They must be where the action is. They must be the action. They drink the most, laugh the loudest, wear the gaudiest clothes. Show the world they don't give a damn, that's it. Thumb your nose at the whole damn sinking world and keep believing they really envy you. Couldn't have said it better myself. So in conclusion, porn warps your mind and corrupts your morals. And that's a good thing. This movie is to porn what reefer madness is to weed. Using the thin veil of education and moral panic to disguise blatant exploitation. Except this is worse than reefer madness because it is the very thing it is warning you against. Make no mistakes, the creators of this movie knew exactly what they were doing and I respect the hell out of them for it. But you gotta wonder if they actually thought they could get away with it. Hell, maybe they did. In the early 60s there were a bunch of educational films about nudist camps because it was the only way to get nudity into a movie. Maybe they found some loophole where they could show you porn as long as they told you not to look at it. It's a hilarious display of tongue-in-cheek hypocrisy with some wildly outdated bigotry as the cherry on top, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And that's The Lusting Hours. If you enjoyed this one, maybe you'll like my review of McGee and me. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, Martha! Yes! That's a character I don't want to be recurring. Uh, until next time, I'm Matt, and this is Matt's Funtime Weird Movie Show. Uh, Matt, I don't think this has anything to do with Lumberjacks. I think this is just porn. Yeah, I, I think you might be right. Oh well. When in Rome! <laughs>